Welcome to the Terrible Podcast with your host from SteelersDepot.com, where you can find all your latest and greatest Steelers news. It's Dave Bryan and Alex Kazora, always lit, talking Steelers. And now, here's Dave and Alex. Welcome to the Terrible Podcast, Season 11, Episode 115. He's Dave Bryan. I'm Alex Kazora, SteelersDepot.com. Glad you guys are back with us for this Tuesday edition of the show. Dave, how you doing? I would have been doing a lot better last night had Tristan Jerry <laughs> not gotten a, got not gotten an assist on the <laughs> right. on the game winning overtime goal there. Boy, they uh man, what what an exhilarating game, especially that uh, you know, second period and, 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 and really the third third and fourth I think as well or you know, as well too. Obviously got into uh uh double overtime there. Uh uh Man, this Penguins team got their backs up against the wall uh, 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 right now and going to be interesting to see what happens. I guess the next game will be, what, Wednesday night there and all. But mm-hmm. uh, not a way that you want to give that one away, most definitely, yeah. uh, on on, on uh, Monday night. I yeah, gave it away basically literally. So hoping for the Pens to uh, win these next two and win the series, but an uphill climb for them. As for the Pittsburgh Steelers, not a lot happening since we last spoke on Friday. Today does mark the start of OTAs where the team can get together. We'll see exactly how many players will be in attendance. Remember several weeks ago, the team released a statement saying that they would not be attending voluntary OTAs. It sounds like that many players will be showing up, but we'll get the official head count. It'll be roughly a little bit later today. So it'll be the, Phase two of the offseason, and hopefully we'll get to see uh, the returning players, including, it sounds like, quarterback Ben Roethlisberger. Yeah, and it will be interesting, you know, I, I, after the team, you know, released a statement several weeks ago there, you know, along with several, with really all the other teams, you know, uh, along with the NFLPA and and the whole boycott, and how's that boycott go, going? Not well. And, uh, uh, so it would be interesting to see if a guy like uh, Cameron Hayward actually shows up, you know, uh, as well. Now, I know there's been uh, evidently some talks, I guess, between, you know, uh, uh, you know, players and and teams as far as their level of 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 exertion and and uh is it mostly just learning as opposed to being out there on the field uh you would think to some degree though there's going to you know teams are going to want to have something get done on the field right or no it sounds like the Steelers will just be holding, you know, the normal OTA sands, no 11 on 11s. Um, so there's really got, not going to be any sort of contact drills at all. It sounds like it'll be individual and probably a lot of seven on sevens. And, and as you said, just kind of more about the learning environment. So this seems to be the mini compromise the Steelers uh, coaches have made with the players to get some more players there. Again, I'm sure not every single player will attend. I'd be kind of surprised if Cam Hayward attended, considering how strongly he came out against, uh, you know, the, the idea of the NFL holding its offseason program. Um, so I'd be surprised if he attended, but it sounds like it'll be more of a seven on seven individual skeleton kind of a OTA. Well, this union just can't get things right, can they? <laughs> you know, with uh, uh, you, know, you, you get all the you know most of the players to kind of uh, you know to agree to release a statement like that, and you know, uh, look, you you knew you knew what was going to happen with the rookies uh, mm-hmm. uh, across the league, and 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 I don't know, were there any draft picks overall that that uh, even some of the higher ones that uh, chose to boycott? Uh, obviously not with the Steelers, but I'm talking mm-hmm. about about league wide. Do you remember hearing anybody else that that did not report to rookie minicamp? No, I'm not aware of any name. Now, maybe there was one or two out there, but I don't recall any rookie missing. And why would they? I mean, they knew they had to be there, and, and, and that was kind of the start of their NFL career. So the the fact the union was trying to dissuade these guys from showing up to do, to tell day three picks and undrafted players and, and try out guys, hey, don't show up. I mean, what did you think was going to happen? They weren't going to listen to you. Right. Uh, the, you know, one of the things obviously interesting to see uh, as this week progresses and, and haven't gotten any kind of a media schedule from the team yet uh, here. So, uh, uh, you know, how many of these guys you know, will Ben Roethlisberger speak this week? I think normally he does, doesn't he? First week of OTAs or or at some point. Uh, I have to look back and see when, when his track record has been at speaking at, at OTAs here. Uh, 
you would think a couple of these guys are going to be in front of the camera this week. So that, that'll be something else to be interesting to see uh, uh, transpire this week. Yeah, and that was the subject of my terrible take yesterday was, you know, it's good to hear the rookies just in general, of course, but then to hear them talk about Matt, Matt Canada's offense, hear it from Najee Harris and Pat Frymuth. But, you know, when you talk about the, the compare and contrast from Feetner to, to Canada, you, you can't talk to the rookies because they don't have anything to compare it to. They didn't play for Randy Feetner. So um, I want to hear from the returning guys, even second year guys like Chase Claypool and Kevin Dotson and others, um, just about, you know, what the biggest differences are from a Randy Feetner coached offense versus a Matt Canada coached offense. And obviously I'm expecting to hear things about motion and pre-snap stuff and things like that. But those are the guys I want to hear from more so than the rookies who don't have anything to compare to all they've ever known in their brief NFL time is Matt Canada. Right. So that, you know, ho- hopefully those kind of questions will get asked this week as well. Right. Yeah. Uh, and I imagine that they, they probably will. So um, that'll be the big things to watch for uh, when it comes to uh, the Steelers news week this week. But until then, not a lot of pressing news uh, since our last show on Friday. Dave, you've done a lot of work on Najee Harris over the last several well, well, days. Well, before we get there, you oh, know, one guy who said uh, uh, indicated that he you know, probably wasn't going to be able to take uh, part or wasn't going to take part in OTAs, Cassius Marsh. Uh, uh, was one of those that, that said he was going to miss the OTA sessions. Be interesting to see if he actually does. Uh, he had a couple, you know, interesting comments in in, in a couple of separate interviews the last mm-hmm. couple of days. Yeah, uh, just talked about you know his NFL journey, and it's certainly been a very bumpy one as a fourth round pick of Seattle in 2014. I believe he said the Steelers are now his sixth or seventh team. Um, he's, he's bounced around. You know, quarter of the league, it feels like at this point. But, um, you know, he said that he feels like his pass rush ability and his ability to play special teams are the reasons why he's still stuck in the league and the reasons why uh, the Steelers picked him up off the Colts practice squad last year. And he says the expectation is that he'll be competing for that, you know, third outside linebacker rotational spot, which is kind of what we guess based on the current lack of depth on the depth chart. And so um, when it comes to Marsh, I think there is some, at least a little bit of pass rush ability. And I think he can't play special teams. But the big question about him is can he play the run? And last year's brief answer was he really struggled. Uh, we'll see what he can do in his first full year with the team. And obviously, and I didn't keep Butler kind of talk about this earlier in the offseason about how, you know, uh, kind of hard for him to get on the moving train. You know, didn't right. ask him to do too much, dropping coverage. Not like the Steelers dropped their line, you know, outside linebackers like they used to anyway, mm-hmm. uh, as far as that goes. But, you know, Cassius Marsh is a really, you know, uh, the way he's built and kind of kind of the athleticism anyway is kind of one of those guys that you would think would, would excel you know, in, 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 in that area. But once again, this is something the Steelers don't really do. Uh, you know, obviously, how what was the percentage last? Do you have those handy? Uh, uh, it was under 10% for both wow. guys. I can pull up the exact numbers if you want here in just a moment. Yeah, think about this. In TJ Watt's rookie year, 2017, not that long ago, he dropped into coverage 36% of the time. Last year, him and Bud Dupree were under 10%. Let me get you the exact figures here. For both of these guys, um, really, really cut down on the rate for the better. I agree with the decision there. Yeah, Bud Dupree coverage rate eight point six, TJ Watt nine point four, Alex Highsmith eleven point nine. Marsh, by the way, very limited snaps fourteen point three. Wow! Uh, and one, one time we saw uh, TJ Watt had to go into the coverage, uh, got, got away with one there, right? Uh, was that against uh, Dallas? Okay. Well, he gave up. A, there was he didn't oh, give up the touchdown. It was on that extended play. Okay, but uh, what wasn't there one where he was beaten and almost gave up one? Probably. I'm trying to think off the top of my head. There was the one that's just against C.D. Lamb where right. he's had extended play and he's you know he's peeling back and trying to plaster, but you know, that obviously didn't work. Right, too well. right. Uh, but but once again, you know these these are the kind of things that that you know the Steelers defense seems seems to have gotten away from as you know uh, going back to the percentages over mm-hmm. the year. And, and look, I, I you're fine with that. I know I'm fine with that sure. as, as well too. Uh, uh, as Bill Cowher <laughs> he used to tell <laughs> tell Greg Lloyd, rush the quarterback, <laughs> you know, uh, yeah. uh, uh, those kind of things there. But, uh, you know, when, when it comes to Cassius Marsh, you know, a, 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 a guy that we've, we've you know, ha, ha, you know, have talked about quite a bit that hasn't played, you know, uh, quite a bit either. Is it fair to kind of judge him on uh, 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 what we've seen so far? I think it is just based on previous film as well, too. And I know a lot of people will try to defend him and say, okay, well, you know, uh, he was rushed into the moving train and all like that. But I mean, l- l- let's face it, he is what he is. 
Yeah, he was not known as some sort of great run defender prior to coming to Pittsburgh. Um, now, I do think you have to give him some sort of grace, and I wrote that in the article I had written about him that you know last year was so difficult with the pandemic, and you're coming over midseason trying to pick up the playbook on that moving train, all those things. But um, you know, obviously his run defense was was poor, and that's all you can do is just evaluate based on the tape that you've seen of him in a Pittsburgh Steelers uniform. And as I said about um, – I forget what Ed Rush we were talking about uh, a couple weeks ago, but you know, to, to play – in in the Pittsburgh Steelers defense, you have to stop the run. I don't care what position you play, corner, safety, you nose know, tackle, inside linebacker, edge, it doesn't matter. If you can't play the run, you can't play for the Pittsburgh Steelers. This is a run first division, and they've always had that mentality of stop the run first. And if you can't do that, it's gonna be really hard to see consistent playing time. This team's still gonna add an outside linebacker though, right? I think so. The question is just um by which path? By what manner? Will it be a trade? Will it be a Parisian signing? Will it be someone at cutdowns? Will it be some diamond in the rough in camp who shows up? Um, we've seen that with Ola Dany and Tuzar Skipper and guys like that. So I, I think still have to do something or get lucky and someone emerges. But it's hard to be content with the current group that they have. Yeah, uh, I've been reading a couple of things. I saw something on the wire yesterday about Ben Banagoo. Remember our buddy Ben Banagoo yeah, out of uh, TCU? Uh, TCU? And things haven't gone perfectly with him, I don't think, over there with the Colts. Now, I think they're expecting right. him to have a uh, uh, a little bit more expanded role and all like that. But I, I just, you know, reading up on him, it didn't feel like – didn't feel like they have a lot of warm and fuzzies about him over there, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, I think didn't his uh, didn't his playing time kind of not be what 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 a lot of people thought it was going to be, uh, 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 you know, last season specifically there. So uh, I I'm not saying that that's a name to watch, but maybe it's a name to watch. Was there, was there any pre snap interest or uh, pre snap pre draft interest from the Pittsburgh Steelers on Banigou? Yeah, they did. They hosted them, didn't they? It seemed like they they brought him in, didn't they? Okay. Uh, I'm seeing a headline right now that says that. So yes, I believe so. Okay, so that, yeah, that that would make some sense as they because um, they got to get someone cheap too. They can't get right. someone on a, on a on a you know second contract. They get probably a rookie or somebody who signed to a really cheap deal. Right, and uh, you know, still you know still going to hold out a little bit of hope. Maybe a guy like Chase Winovich or something right. like like that as well too. But not not saying that those guys are going to be the guys. But you would think uh, at, at this point, if a guy was brought in, it would be along those lines. You know, mm-hmm. uh, right. kind of a little bit of a pet draft pedigree still young not expected maybe to come in and start can give you a little bit of something uh, on special teams and uh, look this is not anything down on on, on Quincy Roche or or uh, you know a guy that I hope to have a contract number on actually by uh, uh, by 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 later today and that's uh, uh, Jamar Watson hey you know that's one of the undrafted free agents I don't think we've talked a lot about uh, uh, is Jamar Watson what what does he bring to the table? He brings a lot of production. You know, he's the the case of of testing versus tape. Where he had a good career at Kentucky. I know Josh Carney was really high on him, had the profile on him before the draft, but he just had a terrible uh, pro day workout. Now I think actually a Steelers Depot commenter said that through the grapevine, through friend of a friend or something. So take it for what it's worth. But there was a. Uh, Watts was dealing with a shoulder injury mm. in the pre-draft process, and that limited him, and that probably could have impacted some of his his testing at his pro day. Um, and he's healthy now, so you know if that's true, then maybe that explains why that pro day was really bad because the numbers were—I forget the exact numbers—but I mean it was like Jarvis Jones esque. It was mm. really really bad. Uh, I mean, from unless they do something right now, and, and obviously we're 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 through our first round of uh, fifty-three man roster predictions and all, you know, the, we'll look back and probably laugh at a few of those uh, <laughs> sure. uh, uh, a, 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 after the fact here. But I mean, is there any way right now that this team can go into the regular season with just four outside linebackers, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, on their initial fifty-three man roster? Well, they can go with four. The question is these four, you know, right. are these the right four. Um, you know, you could compare this to the tight end group of, I think it was at 2017, where you had a lot of young guys like Jesse James and, and Xavier Grimble, and you went in the camp and see how those guys perform, and they didn't have a great camps, And so then you made the trade for Vance McDonald in camp. So, I mean, you could, of course, still sign someone in free agency right now. I mentioned Trent Murphy. I think that makes a lot of sense as a veteran guy who can set the edge against the run. Um, but I think you just go into camp and see how these guys look. And once you get through two, three weeks of August, then you can kind of reevaluate this group and, and see what you have and what you don't have. Would you bet the farm right now that Cassius Marsh makes the 53? No, I wouldn't. Um, you know, if, if the season began today, I, I would. But, right. um, 
you know, with everything else that could and, 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 and may happen here. Um, but they don't have a lot of options right now. I mean, it's, it's Marsh, it's Roche, and both those guys have their question marks. Right. And then, you know, not not, not too terribly far behind would, would be a guy like Watson. I mean, you could probably mm-hmm. envision if things stood uh, or, or, you know, uh, you know the, way, the way they are right now, depending on kind of the you know, what a guy like Jamar Watson would, would bring you in the special teams, maybe there's an outside shot that he makes to 53. Sure. You know, if they, they then, kept five in total, obviously, probably. Right. Uh, and then you could talk about maybe some of these future contracts, uh, Jarvis Miller, Jameer Jones. Can those guys maybe be the, the ultimate training camp darling that, that we've seen before? Right. Yeah. Uh, I still bet they bring somebody in, and uh, that, and I'm, 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 I'm still, I still have not get, given up my uh, dream for, for, uh, for Jesse James to return either. <laughs> and I know a lot of people probably get tired of talking. So, and you know, I saw some comment, uh, you know, uh, t- uh, I think directed at me on Twitter was along the lines that. Uh, Jesse James isn't all that. He's not that great. Great. Uh, look, he, he is what he is though, you know, and he, and that being a cheap all around tight end and a guy that knows the system, a guy that can come in and give you, you know, so, you know, live up to some level of expectation there in, 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 in all facets. And, you know, I, I still think the Steelers could use a guy like that, especially as, as, as fire Moot develops in the early days here, uh, it's not so much that we we, we, we we think Jesse James, or at least me, you know, uh, is this huge diamond in the rough and, oh, I can't believe he's unsigned out there, that kind of thing. It's just that extra level of depth and the kind of stuff that the kind of player that Steelers go after that, that keeps leading you back to why it would make, a, uh, make, make sense for Jesse James to be that guy. Yeah, uh, James would just be a short-term solution. Um, that's all it would be. It's not about any sort of long-term stability for the position, just kind of an insurance policy against Firemuth just because of the transition it takes for those rookie tight ends. Again, Firemuth, a true junior, played only four games uh, in, in 2020 because that shoulder, I mean, he just it's just going to be a, a jump for him, and hopefully he can make it. I mean, there are things that are working in his favor, being kind of more of a pro-style tight end's going to help, but yeah, I think it would be a good insurance policy. Now, would James want to come here, though? I mean, he might see the writing right. on the wall and say, you know, Ebron's the guy. He paid him a lot of money, and for a second-round pick, I mean, what's my role going to be here? Am I going to be the number two tight end for four weeks and then be the backup the rest of the season running on punts? So uh, he may not want to come to Pittsburgh now. Yeah, but people also aren't beating down his door right now anyway. Sure. And, and look, I mean, that final season that he had with, uh, with the Steelers wasn't awful. You know, and yeah, I, no, it's I, not a talent issue. It's it's. Well, does he want to come here? Does he want, or does he right. want to say, let's wait for a training camp injury to pop up, and and then I'll have some options then. Yeah, but it, yeah, and even that, you have to wonder, you know, what 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 you know, what increase in pay are you looking at, and all like that. And I mean, there there's several layers to it. We don't mm-hmm. know what you know what kind of uh, negotiations have or haven't taken place with him, uh, at, you know, as of yet. But uh, uh, and and heck, he might say, you know, I'm I'm done with I want off special teams. But uh, mm-hmm. you know, tight tight ends usually have to do that anyway, regardless and all. You know, uh, but uh, I, I still think it's a name to watch. But we'll see. Sure. Yeah, no, I, I would love it. Um, you just haven't heard much on, on him for any NFL team, no. including the Steelers. So I think the Bills reportedly months ago had some cursory interest, and nothing ever really came about that. Should mention, by the way, not really Steelers news, more more soft news, I guess, that uh, speaking of the Pens game, that's why we opened the show. It uh, looks like all the rookies were at the Pens game last night. Najee Harris rocking the uh, the, uh, the Pittsburgh sports triple award score of the, the Pens jersey, the Pirates <laughs> hat, the uh, terrible towel. So he's officially everyone's uncle so that was uh that was cool and Kendrick Green was there I think uh, Frymouth and Dan Moore and so it seems like the bulk of the rookie class if not the entire rookie class uh was there which was cool to see them bond yeah I saw uh I, I know I saw Louder Milk I saw Trey okay. Norwood uh I think the only one I'm waiting uh that, that I don't think that I saw was uh maybe Quincy Roche was the only one uh Harvin did we see the huh was Presley Harvin yeah that's the other one two of okay. them uh, I'm, I'm not sure I have to check the, uh, the answer, but, but it makes sense that both those, both those guys were there. So, and you, you were there crushing beers with them, right? Oh, geez. In the old days. Yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, in, in, in the old days I was, uh, uh, who was the Titans office? Uh, uh, Taylor Lewan. Yeah, I was yeah. I was Taylor Lewan. <laughs> we wore Dan. Did you see the Dan Feeney? I think he was uh, with the mullet and he was crushing beers at whatever game he was at. Who? Dan Feeney, that was just like the other day. Just no, I, I I didn't see that, but I I definitely the saw the the uh, the the, the Lawan at the yeah. at the uh, Nashville game and all like that. Uh, <laughs> all right. Yeah, those those days are far uh, are long behind me. 
crushing a nice uh, dyed Mountain Dew. That's right. What, uh, taking his shirt off. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, David. Yeah, to go back to the uh, – speaking of rookies, Najee Harrison, you've done a hey, lot of Hey, how about work. Phil Mickelson doing it for us 50 guys, huh? Uh, yeah. Uh, what, what did it come – I was wait. – I'm not a huge, huge, huge Phil Mickelson fan. And, in fact, I was kind of – Kind of paying attention, I, I I was waiting for 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 the hubcap to come off of Phil Phil Nichols Phil Mickelson mm. on that back nine, but uh, but it didn't happen. But uh, quite an accomplishment by uh, Phil Mick- Mickelson when it comes to like, you know fifty year old fifty uh, is the new thirty, I think. So that's what every fifty year old in my time right. was saying. It was, it was you and Adam Schefter just tweeting nonstop about Lefty being the oldest man to uh, to win a major. So there congrats to him. All right, Dave. Speaking of Najee Harris, um, you've done a lot of good work here the last couple of days, kind of you know putting into context his his past targets and some deeper studies on the potential rookie year expectations and year one output and what that could mean for the Pittsburgh Steelers. So I'll kind of let you frame it however you want to frame it in terms of just what you concluded from your research on Najee Harris. Yeah, let's start. Let's start first by uh, looking at the most recent uh, work I did on him, and that would be the contextualization of his uh, past target targets at Alabama uh not that we're going to you know any, anybody listen to, listening to this is going to I, I think learn a, a a a ton of anything new with him I mean obviously uh he showed especially his last two seasons at Alabama that he could catch the football out of the backfield right uh and specifically in 2020 where he had what was it 40 where was it? 43 passes for 425 yards and four touchdowns on 53 total targets. Uh, the thing that I had yet to really, really do with him, I had, I had, you know, I, I had kind of spot done it on him, but I, I, you know, I wanted to put all of it together and, and, and look at the big picture on him. Uh, I went through and found uh, every one of those 43 or 53 pass targets, 43 uh, pass receptions. And uh, man, I mean, there, 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 there's some college wide receivers that didn't put up that, that kind of, you know, uh, catch numbers uh, last season, obviously there. So uh, it, it, it gave you a lot to look at about how he was used. Uh, you'll be happy. There was a, and I know you already knew this, uh, Alabama used quite a bit of pistol. And mm-hmm. uh, uh, you, you there, there's a lot of instances of uh, uh, of Najee catching the football out of the backfield, out of, out of pistol, out of play action uh, situations there. So that's one thing that I, I don't think I really noted in 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 my full contextualization on that, but uh, worth bringing up there. Uh, once again, in total, he was targeted 53 times, caught 43 passes. Uh, there were maybe a couple that went off his hands, but they were bad throws and, and not any that I would categorize as, oh, that was a drop. So that's a plus right there in and of itself is uh, good hands on him. And there are a few of these where, you know, a c- couple of nice catches, nothing Nothing that 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 really wows you, I don't think. In fact, maybe his best catch of of, of all of them was one that was a little bit behind him against Ohio State in the uh, in, in the national championship game there. So, uh, but good hands overall uh, uh, seems to be a very competent as to 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 knowing. When to leak out on certain play, you know, if his if he if his responsibilities in the backfield are are uh, you know protection wise taken care of, he doesn't see anybody coming. He does a good job, I think, of reading all that, and knowing when to leak out and where to leak out. Uh, additionally, on you know they 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 would use him uh, light him up uh, either wider or 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 make him come out of the backfield on some design, obviously running back screens. Uh, that way, and then not only that, you know, on, on some option routes, and uh, it seems like he does a good job of reading uh, the uh, defender on, on on kind of those option routes there and getting himself open. Obviously, can run away from people. Does a good job after the catch. Now, um, when we're talking about context, contextualization of normal wide receivers and pass targets. You know, uh, one thing that I really, really like to look at is, is is the average depth of target stat. Well, you know, when you're dealing with a running back, not not so much because obviously running backs aren't used in the same manner as as wide receivers. You see them in a lot of check down situations, either wide or, or running back screens, as we just talked about there and all like that. So uh, to come out of this on, uh, he had an average depth of target on 53 targets of 
two eight three <laughs> yards, uh, which would probably still be better than 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 Ryan Switch <laughs> Switch Switch or Ray Ray McLeod. Or, or Ray Ray McLeod, right? But uh, uh, in short, uh, well, in short, uh, very short. Uh, average depth of target really was right at the line of scrimmage, uh, if you will. So that uh, uh, is not surprising. His average depth of completion was a very minuscule .07 yards. I don't know how you would measure .07 <laughs> yards, but, I mean, that's just barely on the other side of the, uh, uh, obviously, on the line of scrimmage. Uh, uh, once again, the meaning of that means nothing, I don't think, especially when it comes to running mm-hmm. backs there. Uh, the main thing that I, 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 I think is the biggest takeaway when it comes to Najee Harris and his 53 targets and really his 43 receptions was he averaged 9.81 yards after the catch. Now, uh, that is a huge number, and according to a stat uh, pro football uh, focus put out there the other day, most yards after the catch per reception in college football last season – and running backs only minimum 35 plus receptions. I wonder how I, I don't remember how many running backs there were with 35 or more receptions last year. Maybe that'd be something to look at. But uh, Najee Harris was second at, 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 at and their number was 9.7, second only to Travis Etienne. Now the Najee Harris 9.7 number stacks up to regular season. I wish sometimes they'd say whether or not this is just regular season or if it was. You know, playoff playoffs included. Uh, I I I I imagine that these numbers, because they kind of match up with mine, are are, are, are regular season only. But uh, regardless, uh, they have them at nine point seven yards after the catch. I have them for a full playoffs included nine point eight one. Uh, 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 you know, yards after the catch there. Now keep in mind that w- that when you chart, at least w- with me, I don't I don't know how how other other sites do it. Uh, I am calculating the yards after the catch from the actual place on the field where the where the player caught the ball. So if he caught the ball uh, seven yards behind behind the line of scrimmage and got to the back to the line of scrimmage, that's seven yards after the catch uh, in, in my book. Is that is that how you view view it? That's how I would envision it. I mean, yeah, because other places would what give him just zero yards after the catch because he didn't advance past the line of scrimmage, but that's not his fault, you know, right. theoretically. So, so based on how I chart and, and, and contextualize things, uh, even though, you know, quite a few of his catches obviously were, were behind the line of scrimmage. Now, I, I think there might have been one or so where he really caught it way behind the line of scrimmage. But uh, uh, the fact that uh, he averaged 9.81 uh, yards after the catch is a huge number, I think. And, uh, I mean, heck, I mean, you would like to see some wide receivers kind of, uh, uh, you know, register those kind of numbers. And, and even if you can get a wide, re- obviously wide receivers catch the ball further down the field and, uh, those kind of things. But, but, but even so that, that is a big number. And now obviously there are quite a few instances where first contact on Naji wasn't until, say five yards past the line of scrimmage. Uh, I, I calculated that as well too, but uh, there is a lot, uh, you know, in short, once again, this isn't overly surprising. I don't think for anybody that watched probably even a, a limited amount of, of, of film when it came to, you know, Najee's college career, uh, he can catch the ball out of the backfield and he can do some things after the catch. He's not afraid of, uh, of contact. I, I think he averaged almost uh, one broken tackle, Per reception uh, last season, which isn't bad, uh, uh, I don't think as well too. So that's the first main takeaway of those catches. Uh, let's see, of Harris's 43 total receptions, 21 of them included him gaining 10 yards after making the catch. So almost half of them he gained. 10 yards or more after making the catch of those catches, 18 of those 21 came at or behind the original line of scrimmage as well, too. So uh, I think this kind of goes back to we'll, we'll circle it back to something I think you wrote just the other day. Right. And that was uh, the fact that you think there's a pretty good chance that that Najee Harris sets the Steelers rookie reception record. 
Yeah, I don't know about pretty good, but I think there's a there's a, a decent chance, there's a plausible chance of it. Um, the record being 62, currently held by Chase Claypool last season, so 63 would obviously break the record. Um, just given you know that he's going to be the every down guy and you only need less than four receptions per game in a 17 game season to hit 63 catches. Um, I think he's got the skill set, and and they're going to feed him the ball as much as possible. So I think it's certainly plausible that it occurs. And yeah, I think that you know we talked about Harris's receiving ability, and that to me, Dave was the thing that really separated him from most of the other backs where, you know, you can draft a good runner and that's you know, step number one, requirement number one. But if you get something more than that, a complete back, someone who can block, someone who can catch and be a real weapon out of the backfield in this offense, especially it's still going to throw short a lot uh, in general and loves to feed its running backs. Le'Veon Bell had, you know, 80 plus catches in, in multiple seasons. Um, I think that just makes him such a, a perfect fit in this offense. Right. And, 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 you know, look, they, they tried to, integrate James, I mean, James Conner a couple years ago. How many balls did James Conner catch? Five, I think. Yeah. I mean, that's who, who, who would have thought that when he came out of right. college, right? Yeah. Complete, so the, the sophomore year or second year, completely different guy became a lot better receiver, a lot more comfortable in space. Harris is that guy and even better than that from day one. Now uh, I, I'm, I'm not saying they need to have, you know, uh, uh, nine, you know, <laughs> they're, they're, it gets you started on, on the Steelers screen game last season, right? Yeah, that was brutal. Now, Harris alone, of course, is not going to solve that. I think that was, there were as many offensive line problems as there were issues with the running back. Um, and hopefully just a more athletic and different offensive line will improve that. But I'm sure they're going to want to try to have a better screen game feeding the ball to Najee Harris. Right, and we would expect some level of that. We would expect maybe to see him occasionally uh, lined up outside, all of you know uh, uh, what they had done previously with Le'Veon Bell. Uh, it just kind of circles back to, to the all-around back, and it's one of the things I think really Kevin Colbert and or Mike Tomlin hit on right after the selection of Najee Harris. And, you know, it – to find an all-around back, and it's one of the things that I said. If, if God, you know, God forbid, if they do draft a running back in the first round this year, they better get one that can do it all. And mm-hmm. uh, Najee, you know, I, I think this, this this part of it now. Now we'll, we'll we'll probably look a little bit deeper into pass protection, but what I've seen so far in pass protection is absolutely fine. I mean, uh, when it comes to Najee, but I, I I think this kind of puts the 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 last rubber stamp on the fact that. This guy, you know, Najee Harris is an all-around back, uh, was the best all-around back in this year's draft, and now we expect him to be used as just like that uh, uh, starting his rookie season. So, uh, once again, I don't know how, you know, uh, maybe two or three people were able to look at a lot of these video clips and, and, and learn a little bit new. I just wanted to put the, you know, it's one thing to be told, well, he's a great pass catcher mm-hmm. out of the backfield he's good after the catch but it's another thing when you actually put it down on paper and and, right. and 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 have the the evidence to back it up and you and i are are huge on letting it show you know watching the tape and then presenting the tape to to, mm-hmm. to the users yeah showing our work is kind of the, right. the mo around here Dave, the other study you did which is really interesting and i want to hear more about it because i was away on saturday when you posted it had a wedding a buddy of mine from college got got uh, married so I, I didn't get a chance to really do the deep read into the study but talking about i believe at least the what production you can expect from Najee harris year one how that correlates to potential team success and just how that stacks up potentially to you know past running backs who have had really impressive rookie season so explain kind of the stu- the study you did uh, this weekend yeah now now here, here's the thing uh obviously every player is different how they're used and, and using past performances of of whoever uh it, it, it's just a template to to to, to look at here and, and I got to be honest with you. I was a little bit surprised when 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 I saw some of these initial numbers. I I, th- I thought they would have been a, uh, a a little bit higher, but this all boils down to to I think what kind of workload can we expect Najee Harris to have in 2021, and how successful should we expect that workload to be? Now, really, those are two kind of different different kind of questions to answer. But uh, for starters. I think we, and we've said this several times, I, I don't think it's out of the question to expect him to log at least 250 carries, right? Right. Uh, I think he can do that 
fairly easily, honestly. All right, that boils down to on a 17-game season, just 14.7 carries per game on average. So unless something happens to him injury-wise, uh, he certainly should be able to hit 250 carries, one would think, over a course of a, a 17 season. So uh, I, 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 there are probably not many people – shaking their head in disagreement, li- li- listening to that aspect of it uh, here. On top of that, uh, I think uh, Harris should log. Uh, uh, it- it- it's hard to imagine him not registering at least 300 uh, uh, touches in 2021 as well. Uh, after all, as we just cited, particularly good at catching the football out of backfield. Uh, and as a first-round running back, he better be able to contribute to the Steelers' passing game right out of the shoot. And, and, and I think we should expect that uh, to happen as well, too. Now, with those minimum kind of total carry and, and, and touch amounts established, I want to look back and see how many rookie running backs have managed to log at least 250 total carries uh, in their first NFL season and, 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 and what the level of success each had uh, if that mark w- was hit. Now, I mean, going all the way back to 2000, uh, I thought this number would be higher. Maybe you didn't or, or, or wouldn't have thought. Uh, surprisingly, only 19 total running backs from 2000 to 2020 have managed to log uh, at, at at least 250 carries during uh their their rookie season. Okay, since when? 2013. 2000. Oh, 2000. Uh, only 19. So that's uh, what about one per year, a little less than one per year. Yeah. Um, I I didn't have I guess an expectation of what the number could be, but that does sound a little low. You know, that's obviously a little slightly less than one the, the one per season. Additionally, uh, uh, Saquon Barkley was the last rookie running back to accomplish that feat of 250 uh, total carries. That was back in 2018 when he had 261 total carries. Uh, He touched the football 352 total times uh, on his way to registering over 2,000 total yards from scrimmage. Now, the thing is, you look at those, how, how, uh, thinking back and just remembering what you remember, how did you view Saquon Barkley's 2,000 total yard from scrimmage rookie season? Really successful. Just didn't really make the Giants a whole lot better. Yo, know, in theory, you would think, oh, man, you look at the number, you say, man, he'd be you know, 2,000 yards from scrimmage. How, how, how fantastic was that? Uh, you look at some of these advanced metrics when it came to Barkley, uh, his D-Y-A-R, if you need an explanation of what D-Y-A-R, go to Football Outsiders real quick and you'll get a great breakdown of that. Uh, uh, he had a stat of 127 in 2018, which was 14th best in the NFL uh, of all running backs that season. Now, you and I like to talk a lot about successful run rates, all right? And uh, their their successful run rate uh, at uh, at at, at uh, football outsiders is a little bit tougher, I think, than the one that I like to use, which is forty uh, percent on first down, fifty percent on second down, then obviously one hundred percent on third and fourth down. Uh, I think there is as long lines of forty five percent on first down, then sixty percent on second down, then obviously a hundred percent on third or fourth down. But even using theirs, which is a little bit more stringent, not you know, not uh, not. Not terribly more stricter, but uh, it was a woeful 41% run success rate for for Saquon Barkley in 2018. Uh, the lowest of the 19 running backs that met the 250 carry threshold as rookies dating back to 2000. So if you go back and you look at all of the rookie running backs from 2000 to 2020 that had at least 250 carries, Saquon Barkley had the lowest mm. run success rate of that group. I was, yeah, I, was, I was not expecting to find that. Right. Who was? Um, who else was near the bottom? I'm just curious about some other names that were around there, if you have those handy. Uh, let's see. Successful run rate. Uh, Trent, <laughs> Trent Richardson, probably not a surprise. <laughs> Yeah, but Barkley was below Richardson. Right, was below Richardson. Uh, Rich, Richardson with Cleveland in 2012 had a run success rate of 43%. Now, his 
you know, we, we talk about that D Y A R R stat. You know, I think there's a lot to be said in, 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 in that, uh, Richardson had a negative 51 number while, while Barkley had uh 127 number there. I, you know, why is Barkley that much better than, than Trent Richardson in that area? Well, a lot of Barkley's runs or, or a lot of Barkley's yardage, both, Runs, successful runs, and 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 catches. Remember, this is a kid that caught. Damn, he, how many passes did he catch that 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 season? Uh, Ninety one. All right. Uh, so he had a lot of explosive plays in there. If you look at you know a, a lot of his runs that were good runs, man, he had a lot of them that were more than double explosive runs there. So, A, I think that's where you separate the difference between a guy like Barkley and, 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 and Trent Richardson was, was the explosive play factor, okay? But mm-hmm. that still, it's one thing to have that explosive play factor. It's just, can you be more consistent when, when you're not having those explosive plays? And the answer to, to Saquon Barkley, at least get going back to his, his rookie season, was no. And, you know, look at another guy down at the bottom. Matt Forte was at 43% success rate. Cadillac Williams at 43% there. I'm not trying to say that Saquon Barkley, you know, is a bust or anything like that. I'm just saying, man, for to, to look at the amount of total yards of scrimmage, there's a lot of lot of Fred Flintstone going on there, you know. A lot lot of you know uh, uh, the the legs are moving, but not not a lot happening uh, right. with, with, <laughs> with, with 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 the car kind of thing right there. Uh, obviously, going to be interesting to see how how Saquon Barkley uh, uh, progresses. But anyway, we've kind of gotten off track here. Uh, uh, who who was the leader uh, uh, of that group of nineteen? Clinton Portis, way back in 2002, had 273 total carries, 61% run success rate, and had a DYAR number of 410. Hell, they, why didn't he have like you know, 400 more carries that uh, uh, that 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 season with that kind of success rate? 61%. Now that was way back in 2002, and wasn't Alex Gibbs who, who was the uh, who was the offensive line coach back then? Probably Gibbs for Denver. A so lot, lot of outside mixed. zone, right? Yeah. Yeah, uh, the king of uh, of zone running. All right. Uh, anyway, back to uh, back to Barkley. One last note on him, and uh, he was, he was, and, and kind of as I alluded to, he's kind of a feast or famine running back. I mean, uh, he averaged five point seven six yards per touch, but you know. Uh, you just w- w- would probably like to have seen more consistency with him. All right. Uh, at a minimum, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong here, just looking at, at back at some of these numbers, at, at a minimum, a 48% successful run rate, I think should be expected out of a guy like Najee Harris. What was the Steelers' running back run success rate last year? I forget the number. It was not good. No, but uh, it was probably a little bit higher than what a lot of people thought it it, 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 it it might be. Hold on here, and I thought I had something pulled I just, up. I, I'd rather use the number of the baseline of where the Steelers were at last year to gauge where I want that number to be this year as opposed to what you know, Barkley or Portis or someone else you know, did. All right, uh, hold on here, and I will uh, log me out there. I don't know why. I did because I think they on. were – they weren't the worst in run success rate. I think Denver actually, funny enough, who, uh, Mike Munchak, Coach Broncos, were worse in an overall – run success rate um so i i, I want to get a feel for that number and hopefully add a couple points to it and that is hopefully the uh number for nashi harris all right let's look at uh the 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 running backs individually when it comes to run success rates last season okay sure uh if you had to guess with james connor based on the and this is based on the i wish there was a more that's why i wish the nfl would go to would expand into more official uh, advanced metrics because mm-hmm. you always have to clarify. Well, I use this metric, you know, uh, but 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 using the same metric that I that, that I used in this article, you know, Football Outsiders uh, run success rate metric uh, here. Tell me what 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 by memory or what you think James Conner's successful run rate was yeah. on his. 169 total runs last year. Yeah, I don't remember off the top of my head. I think it was a little bit better than than the other guys. I'll say 50%. Well, 50% is 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 quite a 
you give me any running back in the NFL that, that has a run success mm-hmm. rate of 50%, I'm doing jumping jacks, man. Well, what was Connor's number? 49. Good guess. Okay. Yeah, so I, I knew it was a, a decent number. Connor again had it was a talented bat. I mean, it just the injuries just just really hurt him, obviously, literally and figuratively. So, um, you know, it's not that he was unsuccessful when he was on the field; he just wasn't on the field enough. Now his his uh, D Y A R number uh, obviously uh, uh, wasn't as good, but it was still a positive number, just barely. It was eight. Okay. Uh, what is considered a good number? No, I'm number? sorry. It was 34. Okay. Okay. And, is, and, 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 and it ranked. Okay. What is a good number? You so say an average number. Yeah. What is a baseline? Cause a 34 to me, doesn't mean a whole lot trying to con- conceptualize how good of a number that is. Hold on here. Let me see uh, I can... This number can run the whole gamut from 120 to negative 80. I mean, I, I, what is it? Zero is that? All right, you know, uh, let, me, let me make sure I got that right here. I just log back in to this. James Conner's number was eight. I'm sorry. And he ranked 34th league wide, but this is, uh, this is minimum of 100 rushes. Okay. Uh, what was the top D D Y A R number last year? I'll, I'll give you the top five. Derrick Henry, 386, uh, uh, Dalvin cook, 335, Nick Chubb, 276, uh, Aaron Jones, 254, and Alvin Kamara, 253. Uh, so then then you, you go all the way down now. Now, here's the success rates on those top five as well, too. All of them well over 50%. Uh, 57% for Henry. Cook was 56%. Chubb, 52%. Jones, 59%. Kamara, 54% run success rates there. So... Okay. Uh, go all the way down to Connor once again. Uh, you know me, me saying doing jumping jacks on a on a player getting fifty percent. I mean that that's 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 the that's the low bar, man. Mm-hmm. You know. Sure. And then with McFarland and Snell again, sample size is smaller. At least for McFarland, Snell is a little bit larger. Uh, I'm going to say they were. You know, Snell was like forty. Six percent, and McFarland was like forty-four percent. Right, guess. And, and obviously McFarland was not enough to qualify, right. and, okay. and and I don't have that number there. But but Benny Stell did have enough to qualify there. Uh, what, I'm forty-six, forty-four percent, forty-four yeah. on one hundred and eleven, uh, one hundred eleven. I think total runs for him last season. So there. for Harris, and again, we know that a lot of this is dependent on offensive line play. Running backs can't do it alone, but if he can get, get in the low 50s, I would say 52%, 53%, if he can be there. Um, not that I'm going to be married to that number. You want to watch your tape and how he just plays overall, but if he can get in the low 50s, I think that'll be where you want him to be at a minimum. All right, so the expectation should be what is the low bar run success rate for Najee Harris on – and he, he damn sure better have at least 250 carries. Uh, I'll say 52%. Okay. I, I think that's fair. So, you know, when, when you know, I, I said at a minimum, uh, right, so- what, what I wrote at in the article, 46, 48% success rate should be expected. But if you want to lower the bar, you know, you could get into Mike Anderson in 2000 and, uh, you know, Doug Martin. Uh, but, you know, the, the, here's the other aspect of that number. You know, having a run success rate of, 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 of say, 50% or 51, 52% is fine. We got to see that DYAR number, I think, you know, at least, you know, uh, uh, includes a successful run rate. Let's see. Quite honestly, just four of them had a successful season from, from an advanced, now, four, Four out of 19, Alex, all right? So just four of them had what I would deem a successful season from an advanced metric standpoint, which includes a successful run rate of 50% or greater, which you would say, yeah, it needs to be 50% or greater, right? Mm-hmm. And yep. a DYAR stat of at least 180 or greater. You know, we talk about the top five backs all had, uh, you know, what three hundred? Yeah, yeah. two two fifty plus or what what not last year there. So uh, got to have Najee Harris of at least one hundred eighty or eighty or greater. Those four running backs uh, that, that deemed successful that these are rookie running backs once again with at least two hundred fifty carries from two thousand to two thousand twenty. Those four running backs were Clinton Portis, Ezekiel Elliott in two thousand sixteen, Alfred Morris in two thousand twelve. <laughs> 
uh, and, and Jamal Lewis way back in 2000. So really the only, you know, you, 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 you get it back into talking about, you know, should you, should you spend a first round draft pick yada, yada on, on running back there? I mean, Clinton Portis and Jamal Lewis were really the only two pre-2012 that you'd say, look, man, you know, that th- those guys were successful. And really since then, it's really only been Ezekiel Elliott and, and Alfred Morris wasn't even drafted, was he? Uh, actually, six rounder. I six rounder? Right. Okay. Uh, you know, you had to throw in the fungible factor there. Mm-hmm. Uh, so basically, because I'm thinking about the, what are the conclusions here, you're saying that the odds are not high that Najee Harris has a successful season based on those two numbers. Right, but once again, as I started off the whole conversation with, past performance does not <laughs> you know, feel sure. like, a, feel like a, a, a lawyer on one of these stock commercials here, right? Mm-hmm. But yeah, the history is pretty telling. You know, the, the number of guys who have been successful based off of those metrics are low. Right, right. And, so, and that could be a potentially a product of, well, they just run some bad teams. When you're on bad teams, it's hard to have really strong, successful numbers overall when you're running behind a bad offensive line or just a bad offense in general. Right, but wouldn't you th- wouldn't you think that, that at some at some point through there, I mean, that number would have been higher than, you know, I mean, I guess we are only, we're, we're talking about 19. I mean, we're talking about, what, 20% basically, right? What, what, what's four of 19? Uh, yeah, it's right around there. It is uh, 21%. Right, Cam Hayward will be made available via Zoom uh, today uh, following practice. So did Cam Hayward. Wow. He showed up. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I mean, uh, it's, I'm surprised by that. It's, it's funny, but it's not funny, right? I mean. Yeah. I mean, he was the strongest critic of, of the NFL for holding offseason program. And it, he's the union rep now. Is he the new union rep, right? Uh, he's uh, he's definitely the team rep, right? Right. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. Not not the yeah the team rep. We're Rep- replacing Moan Foster. Obviously, JC Treader is the, the 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 players rep overall. So yeah, that's um. I mean, yeah, he would have to be there for him to be in this new interview. So right. that, that's interesting. All right. Uh, back back back. Kind of putting a bow around around this. Uh, it goes back to expectations here, and especially with you having a first round draft pick. Uh, tied up in him and yeah I know the offensive line has a lot to do with this but I mean if you're if you're drafting a guy that that high as well too you're expecting that level that level of of greatness to help comp overcompensate some aspect of your offensive line aren't you yeah now, I mean yeah. obviously you're not going to put me out there at center or you out there at guard you know but I mean, on a professional level here, I mean, you would think that regardless of, of, of how good your offensive line is, there is some expectation there that the talent of the player in the backfield will help you overcome some deficiencies there. Correct? Yeah. When you when you, you know say this is a first round guy, special player, you think his talent can transcend some of the woes up front. Sure. All right, so I I, I think fifty. So what, what what are the conclusions here? Is what I'm trying to get at. What well, of my, this study? What are the takeaways? That my I my conclusion is that is he is he should have a DYAR stat of 180 or greater and a a run success rate of 50 percent or greater. Uh, okay. He he should he should be number five uh, in this study of running backs from 2000. Rookie running backs from 2000 to two, it would be 2021 now, right? Uh, mm-hmm. I'm expecting him to be number five on that list. But do you think he'll actually do it? Because again, the history says the number of guys that do are few. I mean, you know, you get into predicting: can he stay healthy? Can he? Can he, well, sure, it, but it, putting that aside, he stays healthy. Let's just play. Let's just I would healthy. say that he should be able to. Uh, based on if he's able to get the carry amount and based on his, you know, er- everything. I mean, but we know the carry I, amount. I, I mean, it, it's it, it's hard to say. Uh, do I think he will? Because obviously the odds are against him. Right. That, that's my point. It's saying that just historically, which is all we're working with here. Historically, the numbers say that he won't do it. 
But I, I don't think that's where the argument here is. I think that's what the the whole the whole preface of the post is what the expectations should be, not whether or not I don't think we you know whether or not we think he will or won't. I think it's twofold. I think it's what is what is the expectation, and what do you think the odds are of him actually meeting those expectations will be? Okay. And I can ask both ask both questions. I, I I expect him, and I want him to hit to become that fifth bat. But this data says that even talented bats like Saquon Barkley. Don't always do that. I mean, here, 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 here's the list of running backs that we're talking about here. Clinton Portis, Ezekiel Elliott, Alfred Morris, Jamal Lewis, Mike Anderson. Boy, that's a name for – Mike Anderson, did you realize how old he was as a rookie? Because he was in the military and all. Was he? Uh, no. How old was he? Uh, like 27, I think. Wow. Uh, what was he? It's one of those Denver guys. That, uh... R- right. Uh, boy, you remember he, he hit it in a flash – you know, uh, or you probably don't remember. I just felt like he was. I, felt, I didn't realize 2000 was his rookie year. I felt like he was a 90s guy. But uh, he, he was he was born in 73, and mm-hmm. his rookie season was 2000. So what was he? 20, uh, uh, almost yeah, 26. He turned 27 in that that September there. Wow. If you were dying for Mike Anderson's birthday on the podcast, you're it's your lucky day. If what? If you were dying to know when Mike Anderson was born <laughs> today, it's your lucky day, Steelers. Uh, Doug Martin, Kareem Hunt is on this list. Uh, Willis McGahee, Eddie Lacy had 284 attempts his rookie season. He had a success rate of 46 and a, uh, a DYAR of, of 284. So really, it wasn't an awful rookie season for Eddie Lacy. You know, overall, I don't think. Uh uh, Anthony Thomas, remember him? Marshawn Lynch, Ladanian Tomlinson, uh, just goes to show you can't can't judge him completely by the rookie season. Ladanian Tomlinson had 339 attempts as a rookie, on a success rate of only 45 percent, but he did have a uh, 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 D, and he had a negative 24 DYAR. So, I mean, this is a guy that ended up in the you know, Hall of Fame, right? And and not a great rookie season at all. Chris Johnson, Steve Slayton. How about a throwback name, Steve Slayton? Uh, uh, Leonard Fournette, Cadillac Williams, Matt, Matt Forte, Trent Richardson, and Saquon uh, Barkley. So once again, uh, you know, it's the expectations versus whether or not we think think he can. I mean, what leads you to believe that he that 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 Najee will meet these expectations. Just the the runner he is, um, and the fact that James Conner was at forty nine percent last year. Can Harris get a couple ticks above that from the success standpoint? Um, I think he'll be able to do that, and, and maybe just a revamped offensive line in general. I mean, I'm not I'm not married to a number necessarily. I just want him to to make a positive impact. I want this team to be better in short yardage, especially. So that's certainly one area that I'll be looking for. You know, in terms of metrics of success rate, is just third and short, fourth and short, goal to go. Um, those type of things, which is again a collective, not just tears. But um, you know, those are the things I'll be really looking for. By the way, Le'Veon Bell just missed his study. Two hundred forty-four carries his rookie year, so he just right. missed out from being included in this group. Uh, and what what year was his rookie season? Bell was twenty thirteen. Uh, let's look at what. I'm guessing his numbers weren't great, considering his yards per carry was three and a half, and uh, he didn't have a lot of explosive plays as a receiver. I'm gonna guess that uh, his metrics weren't. Spectacular. His successful run rate was, and he was never. I mean, he was an okay successful run rate runner, but mm-hmm. but but not off the charts. Uh, you know, from 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 what I forty seven percent his rookie yeah. season. Yeah, I didn't think it was going to be particularly high. And his uh, DYAR number, his rookie season was seventeen. Again, just because he didn't have the. the- Super big explosive plays or anything like that. So that, that's uh, not a surprise either. All right now, I mean. Hopefully Harris can do better than both of those numbers. Najee, Najee's been compared a lot to, 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 to Le'Veon Bell throughout the process, right? Right. But I think, remember Bell, his rookie, he played heavy. He played at like 240, 245. And by his sophomore year, he slimmed down. And actually got about to, to where Harris is at now, that 225, 230 range. And so I think Harris is kind of like Bell, but. Sophomore year, Le'Veon uh, Bell. Now, 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 here's the thing. What, what if Najee does it? What if Najee does hit the the uh, the threshold of the carries, 250 carries, but doesn't deliver the metrics that we're looking for? 
I mean, what does that mean? <laughs> well, I got to watch the tape. I got to see how it actually looks. You know, I mean, it could you know could be some negative plays in there that impact things. But 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 based off of this study, just because you don't hit the metrics your rookie doesn't mean you can you're you're a bust. I mean, as you said, LT it's his first year it didn't look great in terms of the metrics, but obviously at Hall of Fame career. Right, right. So I, I don't. It's not it's not death sentence. I I don't think you ring the bust bell, but you do raise your eyebrows a little bit. I think depending on how it looks. I mean, maybe the line is just terrible. And it just, it's just not even his fault. I mean, well, if that's the well, case. This team is absolutely going nowhere. Period. <laughs> sure. Yeah, absolutely. But it's it, it's hard to sit there and say today and say, well, if the numbers are forty eight percent and sixteen, then that means he's he's not. It's not going to work. I mean, it, I got I got to see how it looks. Uh, only one Hall of Famer on this list, right? Uh, uh, LT. Uh, LT, right? Yeah, unless Anthony Thomas has been inducted and I was not made aware. <laughs> uh. <laughs> Clinton Portis ever going to get in? Probably not, right? I doubt it. All right, uh, what's uh, what you know? What what's your main takeaway from all this? I'm not really sure, to be honest. Um, just, just, I, I mean, are, I are the expectations fair? And I, I wanted to come away with what I thought was was the expect what the expectations should be. And mm-hmm. I think the expectations should be over a 50% run rate and a DYAR of, of, of 180 or, or greater. Uh, it, yeah. Is that, is, is that a good enough takeaway here? Yeah, I think that's a good takeaway. There is a takeaway okay. to have. All right. Okay. So good study there. I know that was probably a lot of work to, to sift through. So appreciate you, um, you know, putting all that in the context. Right. And uh, you know, as far as do, do we think he will hit those numbers? Yeah, <laughs> I mean, you would you would think the shape that that he's in and the program that he comes out of and and just uh, I mean, where 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 does he rank in 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 all of this? You know, when you when you look at all these other backs, because there there are a couple scab backs on here, Steve Slayton, uh, scab backs, kind of scabs, you know. <laughs> Is that me? Uh, just, you know, guys that you wouldn't expect, I guess, to be right, on this okay. list. You know, Steve okay. Slayton's of the world. Right. I mean, who would have expected? I mean, I guess Anthony Thomas was an early round draft pick, right? Uh, uh, Mike Anderson, who would have thought that? Alfred Morris and all like that. You know, so there was there is some level of fungibility in there, you know, for, for, mm-hmm. for what it's sure. worth. But uh, anyway, that, that that's where I'm at on him. And, and that's kind of what my expectations. And if he does not mix... Make, uh, make those uh, expectations, like you said. We'll have to look back at uh, uh, at, at the tape and see just how bad the offensive line was. A lot of the fungibility, though, is just zone schemes with like Shanahan Gibbs. It's basically like the fungibility, though. So uh, maybe the Steelers should run more of a, a zone scheme this year. Yeah, that's that's, that's, an in, that's an interesting point. Who was the it's offensive Jason line coach or... with Slayton? Uh, with a te- what, what you were two thousand eight. All right, well, give me a second here because I did not have that information off the top of my head. I'm going to have to try to look it up. But you mentioned Anderson and Portis and uh, Morris. Those were all Gibb, Shanahan, you know, either the guy or the disciples. So, I mean, there's your uh, there's your connection there. Three, three. Uh, let's see. You had a Denver back in there uh, with, with, with Portis in 2002. I'm vamping here. Alfred Morris, uh, 2012 with Washington and Mike Anderson in 2000 with uh, with, with, with with Denver. Uh, the Texans O-line coach was John Benton, who actually I think I had mentioned him at some point earlier this year. He's with the 49ers. He was with Shanahan. Now he's the Jets O-line coach and run game coordinator. So he was, looks like basically another Shanahan philosophy kind of guy. Interesting. Yeah. So, uh, run more zone this year. And they, and they, Steelers, uh, hired Chris Morgan to be the assistant O-line coach who worked with Shanahan in Atlanta. So I think, I think we will see some outside zone and an increased emphasis on inside zone this year. All right. Great. Great. All right, uh, where to? Uh, everyone's favorite topic. Peter King had his Ooh. NFL power rankings and put the Steelers 19th. He says he wrestled with the, de- the decision and was burning the midnight oil trying to figure out where to rank the Steelers. I know we've all been waiting with bated breath to know where Peter King was going to rank the Pittsburgh Steelers, and they come in at 19. Boy, why does he got it? He, uh, the way he framed this at the end of, of that arc, quite the apologist, right? To be honest, I don't care about anything Peter King says anymore. I, I, I don't either, but I, I, from, from the fact that I do that I used to respect the guy, and now I don't because of the way he 
you know, the way he writes now and, and, and some of the reasoning and all that he has there. But uh, uh, look, did, did, did he get the did he get the ranking right overall? Is it fair? Yeah. I mean, it's a little on the harsher end, a little on the lower end, but I mean, it's not. I, I think it's fair. I mean, I, I'm projecting this team as like a nine and eighteen this year, so I guess that probably puts him in like a nineteenth power ranking. I, I could have done with him and, and all of his apologistic, you know, uh, of all the teams that he ranked. This is the one that I wrestled. Blah blah blah. I mean, uh, that that sounds like he's trying to protect himself from, mm-hmm. you know, and and I, you know, have a stand, you know. <laughs> Don't tell me about the labor ta- labor pains, man. Just show me the damn baby, you know. Uh, and and I, I I that's the you know that's the biggest thing that I have uh, the problem with this is, is is why of all 32 teams does he have to to uh, be the apologist with the Steelers there? Right. So I mean, again, it was kind of a uh, mealy mouth way to, de- to describe it and rank it. But 19th, I mean, I'm not losing sleep over it. I wasn't going to lose sleep over. Anyway, he ranked the Steelers. So if they wind up going eleven and six, he could say, "Oh, well, I told you, I, this is the one that I uh, that 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 I uh, that I wrestled with the most." <laughs> right. So that's know? why I just don't care about what Peter King says or writes. You know, that, boy, uh, I know you didn't grow up with him, but Alex, let me tell you, grow, growing up and, and you know, as as a young sports fan, I mean, you couldn't wait to get your hands on Sports Illustrated, man. I mean, you, you you really couldn't as a kid, and 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 Peter King obviously, and, and who was the you other know, Frank? Uh, I think Frank DeFord. I mean, some of these guys, you know, you couldn't you couldn't wait to read, and now here yeah. we are, you know. All, all it was these... like that with, with me and Rick Riley. Rick Riley growing up was like the guy, and then his just career just kind of went off the rails. Is he still alive? <laughs> he's still alive. He's still is, alive. is he? I mean, I, I mean, yeah, I, I, he's, I, mean... He's, he's, I think he's still with ESPN technically. I mean, you just never see the guy anymore. Okay. He just I, I, maybe he wrote something on the Masters because he probably just writes about the Masters now. You know, Roy, when it came to TV, too, Roy Firestone. I, I don't know how much you remember Roy Firestone, yeah. but uh, he he was another ESPN guy. You want to talk about great, uh, uh, great uh, interviews? Uh, he he was the one, you know, and Jerry Maguire. He'd always get the uh, the athlete to cry, you know. Mm. Uh, and, day Tom Rinaldi. Uh, yeah, I guess kind of. And, and who's the uh, who's the blonde that was the sidekick of uh, Colin? Ka- uh, 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 Kristen Lee, uh, Leahy, mm-hmm. boy, she's good, man. And why she doesn't get a, uh, you know, she did that Fox Sports one, you know, that uh, uh, just recently had a couple of segments or, or had a show on there as well too. I thought she's fantastic, man, at getting uh, getting athletes to open up and talk about things, uh, kind of a la. And I know half of I just lost, as is usually the case, I lost half of our listenership, not not being old enough to to uh, remember who Roy Firestone is, but the other half are saying, yeah, 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 I remember Dave. Uh, well. Uh, Kristen Lee is, is, is kind of that same. Where is that kind of who, you know, where is that kind of journalism right now? You know, it's hard to find. And then a lot of sports center, you know, Titans, Kenny Maine's last sports center was last night. I love Kenny Maine. Oh, how up. great was he growing up, man? Him and yeah. Dan Patrick. And I know. Uh, I mean, you couldn't wait to turn on sports center. And I'm not a huge Keith Olbermann fan, you know, but but I think he was good. He was back, good, yeah, yeah. But, but back at the day, you know, it, it was always been Kenny Maine and Dan Patrick and and and, and Keith Olbermann and uh, you know, obviously Stuart Scott when when you know uh, 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 became part of that picture as well too. Uh, and now they're running Kenny Maine off now. What you know? What a way to go out! That that interview that he had with Aaron <laughs> Rodgers uh, last night was was absolutely fantastic. Where where are those people now? They don't exist. It's a uh, it's a different dynamic, a different world. I barely watch Sports Center in general. I just you know why 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 bother? I can just scroll through Twitter and, and get all my highlights and news from there. Right, right. But is all that a byproduct of that now? I mean, would we would we still watch if we had mm-hmm. the Roy Firestones or the uh, Rick Riley's or the I don't know I don't think Michael Silver's all that I think Michael Silver's overrated. Uh, yeah, it's a it's a chicken or egg question, but honestly, you could put the best talent on TV, but with the age of the internet and social media, I think a lot of people would just. I mean, half people don't even have cable anymore, so it doesn't matter who you put on; they're not even going to have cable to uh to watch them. What do you watch sports related now? Really, just like local sports. I mean, you know, the just Pens, the actual Pirates. sports, the, the actual. Yeah, I, I, and, and just in TV in general, like I, I don't watch a lot of TV at all, and even just sports TV that isn't you know a Steelers game or a Pens game, Pirates game, whatever. I, I, I barely watch. Right, because I mean, we, I mean, 
hell, I, I not not to pat ourselves on the backs, but, but but we know more than most most of what's being reported out there by the people reporting it now. I mean, you you can usually get most of this stuff off Twitter instantaneously, uh, you know, and, and go from there. Yeah, I'm I'm with you. I watch the games. Uh, I'll occasionally turn on the NFL Network, um, you know, but uh, they've run all the good ones off. The uh, uh, Lindsey Rhodes, they've run her off now, and I mean they've they've run all the good ones off. Yeah, I only have my cable package because I can't. If I got rid of my cable package, I couldn't keep my internet package for some reason. That's what they they're, they're lying to me about. So I, I just have that for for the internet package. All right, but overall, let's see. Nineteenth uh, is is where Peter King has him. In case uh, uh, all of you couldn't get through the rest of the day, uh, not knowing that. What else do we have to talk about here? Uh, by the way, I do want to mention, I apologize, I want to go back to the Steve Slayton comment because I just was so focused on the O-line coach. Um, the uh, for That Steve Slayton rookie year, the offensive coordinator was Kyle Shanahan. The okay. assistant head coach was Alex Gibbs. Ah. So that is like a total you know zone scheme uh, to the max. And by the way, that 08 Texans team had an amazing coaching, coaching staff. Alex Gibbs, Kyle Shanahan, the O.C., uh, Matt LaFleur was an offensive assistant there. Wow. Robert Salah was a defensive assistant for them. So you have... You know, three head coaches there, Shanahan, LaFleur, and Salah, uh, you know, on that team. That's a pretty special group. I think I just created an article for you. <laughs> about the OA Texans or about the, the zone? The zone uh, yeah, team. yeah, about linking all this. Uh, I mean, basically, that that's what yeah. we just were able to. I don't, you know, I don't know if there's it, – it, it's something else maybe to look for now. I mean, look, we already knew that we're probably going to see an increase of, 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 of zone – you know, with mm-hmm. with this coach staff, with this type of running back, uh, and then now we've looked at the expectations based on 19 other running backs, how three of them are, and I'm sure we could go down the list and find more more, more uh, predominant zone zone schemes in this as well too. But uh, I don't know, maybe, maybe there's something there to this. Yeah, uh, that, that that is a good point. I think I should write something about that because I think that is that is pretty interesting there. So, uh, in terms of other things for us to talk about, just one more thing I had listed, and this was um, again the speculation fueled off season from your friend and mine, Bill Barnwell, oh. uh, talking about how why the Steelers should sign Russell Okung or why he believes that they will. I disagree, but uh, what did Bill Barnwell have to say? Yeah, he uh, post as far as post p- potential predict predictions for post June signings. Uh, he has the Steelers and Russell Okung down uh, as, as what he would be his prediction. One year, $6.5 million. A, if they would sign Russell Okung for six, one year, $6.5 million, they'd have to pay him probably in Bitcoin, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because he wants Bitcoin out. That's that's serious, right? Right. I, I, and I'm not, there's no joke there. I mean, that's right. that's that that. That's the truth. Uh, how does that? Do they actually pay him in Bitcoin, or do they just allow him to convert the money? I don't know how that. Do they actually? I guess they actually pay him in it. You know? they actually buy Bitcoin and then give it to. I Goku. guess. I guess. Uh, and if they did do that, I mean, there's no, there's no salary cap Bitcoin. <laughs> <laughs> they obviously would have to get creative in such a thing. It had to be a multi-year contract, uh, probably some voidable years. If I'm Russell Okung, even if I got the 6.5 million, I'd, I'd want every year after that, if I agreed to it to be voidable so I could go out and get another 6.5 million, maybe in Bitcoin in, 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 in 2022 as well too. Uh, Look, I, I get why they keep going back to this, uh, but the fact of the matter is, it would probably go, you know, with him and who who was the other tackle that's that's been recently linked? Uh, Morgan Moses. Yeah, more people trying to link Morgan Moses. I, I get it. I get Okung more than I do Moses because Moses is predominantly a right tackle anyway. There, uh, anyway, I understand why people keep trying to want to shoehorn a, a, another tackle to the Steelers. But let's face it, this is a team that signed Joe Haig during the offseason and paid him more than minimum. Uh, uh, Zach Banner, they gave him a contract. That guy's going to play one of your two tackle spots. I don't care how who you sign uh, uh, b- between now now and and, and start a regular season. There, he's going. You know, uh, and, and, and odds are it's going to be on the right tackle spot as well too. Uh, so unless you have an injury or something to a guy like Chukwama or Corfor, or you're just going to replace Chukwama. A uh, core four and his two million dollars outright because you're not going to pay Chiquama a core for two million dollars to be your swing tackle, right? I mean, 
you could, but T- technically you could, but I mean, you wouldn't think that they would. Two million dollars to be a you know backup tackle is, is pretty cheap. Um, but I think I think they want to see him as the you know in his last year's rookie deal as the left tackle and see how he looks there to evaluate you know what his career arc will be and if that'll be in Pittsburgh or not. I mean, if you could get one of these guys to come in much cheaper than six or five million or whatever, uh, that that's one thing. To, to, I mean, why why'd you even sign Joe Haig? You know, right. Yeah, I, I just don't see it happening uh, financially with how cap strapped they are. Could you theoretically make it work with voidable years? Sure, but um, I think they they're happy with the group that they have. Looks like someone has has, has you know made up a rumor about uh, uh, Malik Hooker as well too, because there is really no evidence looking uh, linking the Steelers to Malik Hooker at this point. We get a lot of people asking us about about that. This is the same Malik Hooker that's been injured. Uh, damn near every year he's been in the NFL. He's coming off of Achilles injury in late September. Uh, if you read the reports on Achilles injuries and all like that, uh, not great. And, you know, usually it takes at least nine months, I think, just to get back to some function ability when it comes to an Achilles injury. So tell me why, I mean, they're, they're, you know, tell me why they're, they're, there's any reason to believe that, that the Steelers would go after a guy like Malik Hooker, who, by the way, is a better free safety than he is a box safety. And you're not going to you know, bring this guy in at, at, at anything more than a minimum, I don't think, to, to have him play on special teams. Yeah, I mean, I, I get it from a on paper standpoint in some respects. The fact that he's a pedigree guy, a local guy, you know, he went to Ohio State, right? So there's, I mean, there's connections there, but Achilles injury, super serious. Um, you don't know how he's going to look coming back from that. And, you know, I, I don't have any information about the interest in Malik Hooker, but I, I just think the report was so vague and so loosely worded that it's hard to even, you know, really take it with a, anything more than a one grain of salt. Right. I have reached out to his agent, but have not uh, heard back. But, uh, uh, I'm not thinking that I will. Yeah, but the report wasn't even that the Steelers have interest in Malik Hooker. It was that they he could be on their list. Oh, okay. Which, I mean, anyone could be on anyone's list. I mean, he's he's on a list somewhere of a list of free agents. But the report was we're hearing he could be on a list. I mean, how much money? How many more qualifiers do you want to put in a report than that? So, like, I, like, like I said, manufacturing your own news, right? Yeah, I'm not trying to be mean about it. I'm just this is an interpretation of a report. You know, I mean, the, the, it's so loosely worded that it could go, you know, in a, in a million different directions. All right. When it, when it, we report things, for example, you know, we try to be as, as specific and concrete. When I said that. The Steelers were hiring Daryl Young to be their new player development coach. I said the Steelers are, are hiring Daryl Young to be their player development coach. I was either going to be really right about that or really wrong about that. We were right about that, and so I try to be extremely concrete and specific, and and you know black and white when I come and, and report things. All right, and when I report that the Steelers gave Rico Bussy a three thousand dollars signing bonus and a uh, fifteen thousand dollars signing bonus for for Watson. That is a report you can take to the <laughs> bank. Nice. I just got the numbers on that, and so Watson. That's decent money for for him. I mean, a bus. He's you know three grand. That's it. But fifteen uh, k. So they spent what they spent with their undrafted guys. Probably close to a hundred thousand dollars. Probably. Uh, let's see here. Let me pull because because I'm just getting those numbers. Steiner and in. Brown got twenty five each. So that's fifty. Um. Watson gets 15, so that puts you at, at 65 right there. I forget what the other guys were, but yeah, you're probably closer to, to 90 or something. Hold on a minute here, and I'll uh, I'll add these up for you real, real quick. Uh, as Hold far up. as the undrafted guys go, let's see, equals times... Carry the one. Three... Uh, so 90, but between the five prior, uh, uh, between the six prior to knowing these numbers today, it was 99,500 total in signing bonus. And I just told you another 18,000. So what's 99,5 and 18,000? 117,5. So look at the Steelers spending a little bit of money. Way to go. Now the, uh, the uh, the maximum they could have spent was what what did I say 160 160 190 yeah they didn't they didn't come close to their allotment uh, which was higher this year so they do have more room to, to do that but uh, more than I anticipated all right so uh, uh, us breaking news during this podcast huh and yeah and, and you can take that to the bank right yep official numbers there for Bussy 
and Jamar Watson. All right, Dave, anything else you want to talk about in today's show, or do you want to uh, wrap things up and get to some reader email? I think people are. I think we wore people out with that probably that that, that Najee Harris discussion there. So uh, I, I would be interested to, to 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 get people's feedback as far as. You know, take the fan glasses off. Are, are those fair expectations for Najee Harris? What we laid out there, as far as advanced metrics and really, you know, overall, 250 carries, uh, 300 total touches. Because look, Alex, I mean, 300 total touches times five yards per average total touch, which I think is a fair expectation. That's 1,500 total yards, man. Yeah, from my expectation of, of the non-advanced numbers, I think it's 1,500 yards. You know, from from scrimmage uh, is a totally reasonable and attainable number. I, I'll put it this way, Dave: I can almost guarantee you, assuming he stays healthy, that Najee Harris will at least be on the qualifying list of the 250 carry club. If he's playing 16, 17 games, he will be on that list. So we will find out what those numbers are, and he'll be the 20th back. Uh, uh, to be included, at least of, of eligible, uh, being eligible for for that list. And look, if he if he hits fifteen hundred total yards from scrimmage, and let's say he plays like sixteen of seventeen games, and he has, I mean, what's what's a good over under touchdown number for him? Eight and a half, nine and a half. Total or rushing? Total. Period. Uh, maybe even ten, just because I mean he had eleven rushing touchdowns or eleven receiving touchdowns his final two years at Alabama. All right, if he hits if he hits all those barriers, those expectations that we just laid out there. All right. I mean, you got to think he's in a running for, for offensive rookie of the year, right? At that point? Sure. I think he's the favorite. Well, I mean, with quarterbacks, he can get, you know, funky because quarterbacks rule the day. But, I mean, he's right up there even today just because, I mean, if in terms of non-quarterbacks, I mean, what guy is going to be just an immediate play, playmaker like him? It, it, there's no other rookie that's going to compare. I mean, that's that, that might not be a bad bet to make, right? Yeah, if you want to, I'm not a uh-huh. betting man, but if you want to put a, you know, some units down on a guy, I think Najee Harris is a good choice. Uh, what is, uh, let's see, fit, he right now, uh, according to uh, uh, DraftKings Sportsbook, at least the latest that they have, plus 800, so eight to one odds. If you had a, uh, got a, uh, Alex, I know you, you, I know you wipe your mouth with a hundred dollar bills. <laughs> <laughs> After eating your bagel so bites, I <laughs> 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 uh, throw a hundred dollars down on Najee Harris winning Offensive Rookie of the Year. I mean, uh, that's that that that's uh that's eight hundred smackaroos, right? So a lot you, of bagel bites. That's a um, lot more bagel bites. Yeah. Do you know? Is that like fifth? Who has higher odds? Who has better odds? And they're all Najee quarterbacks. Uh, right. uh, and, and obviously, uh, you know, only. Probably only one of those four are going to emerge, or only two of those four will probably live up maybe to expectations. And and mm-hmm. and, and those four: Trevor Lawrence, Justin Fields, Trey Lance, Zach Wilson. I mean, a couple of those guys aren't maybe might might not even start right out of shoot. Right, you know, Fields and Lance. So yeah, um, like I said, of the non quarterbacks, he is uh, I think the, the the next guy up, and even he could probably have better odds than some of those quarterbacks too. So if you're listening and you like all that discussion and we got you pretty hyped up about Najee Harris, the pass uh, catcher and, 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 and expectations when it comes to Najee Harris rookie year numbers and the probability of maybe him hitting those, you know, you're welcome because we, we probably just made you about at least $800 there. So uh, uh, within all that, it's probably a good place to uh, to to stop, right? Well, I, I should mention, I missed this story, Marquis Pouncey said he was fine with the Steelers giving out his number to Kendra Green. So, very minor note there. And why wouldn't he be? And and, and, and B, how many numbers did they have left to try to give him anyway? Yeah, not many. And plus, he wore it in high school and college, and so I thought a very mature, classy answer from Marquis Pouncey. Right. They, you remember the memories, right? Yeah. Yeah, he's uh, he's already lost some weight, it looks like. Boy, he, he looks, looks good. good. Yeah, and he looked stuff. he looked fine before. He looks better mm-hmm. now. I wish I looked half like that. <laughs> well, you got to play in the NFL, then you retire. Oh, okay. The weight just comes melting off. But he's doing, I think, uh, protein. I don't know. He's doing some company, some business with his brother now. So so good for them. And they they they're supposed to have a winery or something too, right? They were. Are they? They, they, they working on something along those lines. So uh, good good for him. All right. Uh, within that, a perfect time to stop. Uh, as always, you can follow me on Twitter at Steeders Depot. Oh, you get to oh. read your emails? Oh, no oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, they're, they're, they're unless work. we don't have any. Uh, we we do have some. Let, let me let me get to them here. Uh, la, 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 la. 
Chris Bailey writes in, uh, Dave, glad to hear that you had a great vacation. My question comes from hearing your discussion on YouTube live stream, next Steelers player to enter the Hall of Fame. I agree that Ben will be next. Uh, wondered how close James Harrison would come as you didn't mention him. After all, he has a, de- a Defensive Player of the Year award, a ring, and that highlighted uh, a real pick six. Uh, Chris from England. Yeah, um, Harrison's, I think, going to be under consideration. To me, he's a Hall of Famer because I think he was one of the most dominant players for you know a multi-year stretch, which is kind of my criteria for it. Um, the question is, though, he's only got, what, 84 and a half career sacks because obviously his career started so late in his mid to, to late 20s. Like uh, half of see- Kevin Green. and I mean, some of those right. guys, I mean, not even close on the sack numbers, man. Right. So you just don't see a lot of Hall of Famers get in with under 90 career sacks. So that that's going to hurt him just in the, in the eyes of the non Steelers fan. But he's got a case to make. If there's a guy who's going to be the exception – for all the reasons mentioned, um, I think he could be the guy. Yeah, but well, I, I, I think it comes down to, you know, I, I think he's in that Heinz Ward in that, that you'd have to make it an exception rule. You know, I mean, yes, he was when he played, man, he, he was good. How many how many years, though, did he have double digit sacks? Uh, three. I mean, a lot. Uh, it's unfortunate, but there's a lot of measuring sticks. These guys sure. have to have to meet, man, you know, sure. and. You know, I huge James Harrison fan, and man, I mean, you you can and we talked about you. Know, you cannot think about James Harrison and not think about you know uh, that 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 return for a touchdown. I mean, you know, gate. I mean, your championship championship changing play. Mm-hmm. I mean that that thing is. I mean, uh, fifteen years from now, I mean, you 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 you'd be hard pressed to. To, to find a play that, that kind of measures up in a Super Bowl that measures up to the impact and 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 the, the complete magnitude of that play I mean uh I mean who didn't like that rip move I mean so, you know some of those sacks of his you want to talk about high quality sacks yes but is it enough yeah um, certainly he's not first ballot certainly he's not slam dunk I think he'll be in the the conversation and in consideration very interesting to see how far he gets will he be a finalist semi-finalist where does he kind of end up but yeah the dude didn't start wasn't a full-time starter until he was 29 and still had to me a potential hall of fame career there are very few guys that start the nfl career at 29 and are at least even in the conversation to be in the can and that's pretty special i mean it's okay to be a steeders fan alex and say some of these guys are probably not going to get in the pro football hall of fame you know and, and we take a and we will forever take a lot of uh, uh, flack, I think, when, when it comes to our views on Heinz Ward. Look, I, there's an article somewhere on Steelers Depot years and years ago where fanboy Dave write, wrote that uh, uh, you know Heinz Ward going to be a shoe-in to have a bust in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Well, that guy's gone. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, you, 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 you learn to be, you know, really be more, more objective when it comes to this. Uh, I mean, I, obviously, I hope he does get in, and, and, and I get the argument about changing the game and all like that, but the fact of the matter is that it, when, when you really boil this thing down to, to, to looking at it, what does he, was Heinz Ward ever, you know, top one, two, three wide receiver in the league in any given year? And – I, I think the answer to that's no, and if the answer is, is indeed no, I don't see how you put him in a Pro Football Hall of Fame. Yeah, uh, I'm reading an article. This is from August 11th, 2010. Oh, Hall Lord. of Fame just two good seasons away for Heinz Ward. Actually, when he's still playing, so his career was not over. He says, uh, "You say, quote the voters." That's fan. Not- this is fanboy Dave, right? This is fanboy Dave. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Why the, the hell voters, did you pull that up? <laughs> yeah, you, you mentioned it. The voters might not let him in on the first ballot, depending on who sits ahead of him on the waiting list. But ten years from now, I fully expect to visit the Heinz Ward bust in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. So, you ten, literally ten years from from then, you did visit the Hall of Fame, Dave. Did you see the Heinz Ward? Bust? <laughs> was it exactly ten years? Oh it was, Lord! It was about yeah, 2010, 2020. So, oh almost. Lord, I didn't see it, Alex. Uh, I didn't see it. Yeah. So uh, you have. There were several articles here about Heinz Ward Hall of Fame, but I mean, it, are you saying um, I was r- 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 wrong? In this article, I guess I sent you the link to this. There is a photo, no! a tiny photo of a Heinz Ward bus that is, I don't know what photo that is. It's the creepiest looking thing in the world. I got to send this to you. No, no. I, I just want to know what this is and where you got it from. I mean, it's just this no. little computerized. I might have made it. God, if you made it, that is. He looks, he looks fat and disfigured. <laughs> not a good photo. Of Heinz Ward. I hope that's not how his actual bus looks. Are you pulling this up? Yeah. What is that? 
I made it. I made it. But so I'm made sorry. That. Yeah, boy, you know how long it has been since I've I've looked at this. Uh, uh, what What's your main takeaway from that 2000? And boy, I've been blogging for a lot. I was uh, two years into two and a half years into blogging, I guess, at that time. Mm. What is my takeaway from this? Yeah, the, the other than the bad picture, your art, your, your artistic skills are not very good, and there's a typo in the headlines. So we've come a long way. Oh lord, it's just, just two good season away. Uh, okay, yeah, well, look, t- some things never change, and and, and David is English is is one of those things. Uh, people get an extra bonus for hanging on uh, to the uh, uh, to the podcast. Don't you dare tweet that out. All right. <laughs> ah, that might be too late for that. All right. Um, next question. What do we got next? All right. Uh, from, uh, Dan, uh, uh, Dan Russell in Australia. Good day, Dave and Alex. I've been listening to the podcast for over 10 years and I don't think I've missed a single episode. All right. Uh, now that we're in the off season, could you take us behind the curtain of the Steeders Depot multiplex? What do you and Alex discuss in your pre-production meetings? What does he, who does the editing for the podcast? Uh, we have very advanced pre-production meetings. They take hours. This is a tight ship that we run. No, um, it is literally me and my notebook that writes down the episode number so I don't forget what it is. And then just like scribbling down just topics and uh, checking them off along the way. And a lot of times we go way off the rails uh, yes. most of the time and, and mainly because of me. Alex tries to keep this more structured. I try my best to get him not to be as structured in it but the the funny fact of the matter is if you look at everything else i do site related i get mad when it's not structured when it's not in and as as the obsessive compulsiveness in me as well too i try you know everything needs to be set up this manner blah 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 i try to keep a lot of unity except i guess when it comes to the podcast and actual discussions but uh, we will have you know usually it's about a span about five minutes of things that we want to cover uh and 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 that's the long and short of it. And I do all the editing of uh, of, of the podcast right now, and always have have done that. Mm-hmm. Season eleven. I mean, how many episodes have we done in general, or have you done? Uh, oh God, over a thousand. We're over a thousand, right? Right. Yeah, pretty great. That's that's actually one of the longest running sports podcasts, Steelers podcasts. In existence, I, I mean, guess. there there hasn't been many uh, weeks overall. I don't think where there has been zero, at least one podcast. Because usually, I try to uh, any vacation that I do try to take, we try to you know, at least have one before I go in a given week, and 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 you know, one right when I get back. But uh, anyway, yeah, look, uh, who would have known it would have become what it's become? Uh, this one from Peter Fox, right, saying, "What's up, fellas?" Uh, now, I don't think this would be something we'd consider. Maybe we should, though, but it's interesting that, that this name seemingly hasn't been mentioned since he threw a punch in practice. Earl Thomas is just two years removed uh, from being in the Pro Bowl and four from being on the All-Pro team. Do you guys truly believe that the league has moved on from him at 32 years old, a proven commodity at a position of need for few teams and can get a phone call that doesn't seem... Uh, that doesn't seem to math, but maybe you guys can make it make more sense of it. I, I just, I, I think, I think it's passed him by now. I think, I think his time's over with a, and, and I just, I, no way could I see Earl Thomas being part of the Steelers, even if he was to play in 2021. Yeah, I don't either. I never get, you know, attached to the names and the, the what they've done, but, uh, where they're at now, probably not going to be the guy. Uh, Ted Webb writes in running back depth chart. I, I think we all know. Let's see. This is from a day ago. So this is fresh. I think we all know Harris will be the starter and three down back. But but he is a rookie in 17 games. I don't want to run the wheels off of him in year one. They damn sure better run the wheels off. There, but he better hit those 300 uh, uh, total touches. Uh, LOL. As now things can change in camp. Who's the backup after him? Or should I say Better back or better fit if they keep running wide zone scheme, McFarlane or Snell. Snell has more experience, but seems like sometimes just doesn't hit the hole uh, for me. Runs into blockers or defenders, i.e. the Bills, Bills game last year. Thanks for what you guys do. All right, uh, what, what's the best look at the running back depth chart? 
right now? Yeah, we asked this question last night during the live stream. Um, if I had to give you one name as an answer, I'd probably say Anthony McFarland, just given um, his relationship with Matt Canada, them working together at Maryland. But I think, again, you go into camp, see how those guys look, especially McFarland, year, year number two, that, that sophomore jump and leap that hopefully he makes. Um, but they're different skill sets. Obviously, Benny Snell's skill set much different than McFarland, so it could be more of a situational type thing than anything else. But uh, if I had to give you a name, I would say McFarland. Uh, all right. I think we've got the bulk of uh, what matters there in the uh, email machine. So now it's time to wrap it up there, uh, right at the hour and a half mark, I think. So within that, uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Steeders Depot. You can follow Alex on Twitter at Alex underscore Kazora. Follow the show at Terrible Podcast. Email the show, the Terrible Podcast at gmail.com. If you like what we do and you want to donate to the cause, please go to SteedersDepot.com. Hit the donate button up right navigational bar. And for uh, 20, uh, or, uh, that, that's for the uh, donation, and if you'd like an ad-free version of the site, go to uh, SteedersDepot.com, hit the ad-free button for $25 uh, for one calendar year. You can have an ad-free version of the site as well. Alex and I will be back again, I think, on Friday, uh, kind of wrapping up uh, uh, Phase 3 OTAs, first week of that, and anything else that uh, comes down the uh, uh, you know, pipe as well, too. So in the meantime, as always, thanks for listening to the Terrible Podcast with Dave and Alex.